watching Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I am Shriya and in today's episode we talk about the latest updates from Qatar where the ongoing football World Cup has taken dramatic turns in and out of the field. We also talk about China which is witnessing protests against its Covid policies and the significance of the international solidarity with the Palestinian people in this day and age. We are on day 9 of the FIFA World Cup in Qatar and the tournament continues to witness a lot of drama on field and some of it off field as well. Some powers are on the brink of elimination while others have been coasting. There has been a lot of interest in the performance of Asian and African teams and some controversial incidents and comments about them too. Sidhan Thani, who is in Qatar, takes us through the past few days. Hi Sidhan, so thank you for joining us. Uh, the World Cup is soon going to hit the 10-day mark and can you give us some of the highlights that have been there so far? Yeah, it's been a fun uh, World Cup, Shriya. Thanks for having me on the show again. Uh, I don't know how much you've been watching the games, but from, from, a, from a neutral perspective and a fan's perspective, uh, it's been a really fun tournament because results haven't gone anywhere uh, near what uh, perhaps had been predicted or expected uh, at the start of the tournament. Last night, we watched a, a really good game against uh, b- between sorry Spain and Germany, uh, which was billed as one of the uh, major games of the group stages. Uh, and it lived up to the expectations, of course, uh, thanks to what happened earlier, uh, you know, between Japan and Costa Rica, the other two teams in that group. So, uh, just like that group, all the other groups also uh, wide open as of now. Only France have so far qualified uh, after two two matches with two wins out of two uh, for the next round. Everyone else is still very much fighting for a place in the round of 16. And most teams, except for Qatar, who are out of the tournament uh, as hosts, unfortunately. Uh, but except for Qatar, everyone else is still in the running. So, everything is still to play for. Uh, like you, you were rightly pointing out, we're almost at the 10-day mark. By the end of today, all the teams would have played two games each. Uh, so, uh, so you know, from again, from a neutral perspective, from a footballing perspective, from a competitive perspective, uh, it's it's really good to have a tournament where nothing really is decided. Uh, you know, even this at this stage of of the group matches. So, so that's been the overall highlight. Uh, in t- terms of the top performing teams, uh, I unfortunately missed today's game between Cameroon and Serbia. Uh, apparently, that was a three-all draw, so that must have been a really exciting 90 minutes of football because we, we you know, uh, all a lot of the joy in this sport comes from goals being scored, and we have six goals in a match. Uh, that that really uh, kind of is the best it, it can get. Uh, so uh, yeah, so in in terms of the strongest teams, of course, uh, France look to be France and Brazil look to be the two teams that have. Uh, hit the ground running and uh, have placed themselves in that early uh, favourite spot. Uh, but also Croatia are getting into the rhythm of things. Uh, Spain are looking really good, of course. Uh, and you can never count out the likes of Germany either. But we are still hoping, of course, as we get into the later stages, that there will be more surprises. Uh, like Morocco pulled off against Belgium the other day. Uh, a massive 2-0 win, just their third win. In, in the entire in their entire World Cup history, so so it's been a really fun tournament uh, on the pitch uh, so far, and uh, yeah, I think a lot more to look forward to in the coming days and weeks. And you know, Sudhan, there's been a lot of talk about the kind of response that Asian and African teams are getting. So, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, we've said it time and again on People's Dispatch, uh, Shriya, that. This is a World Cup that's happening in uh, West Asia, in what's called the Middle East. Uh, And it is very much uh, an Asian tournament in that sense. Also, the continent of Africa uh, is very, is is geographically uh, very close uh, to Qatar. So, it's it's a lot easier. There are a lot more people from uh, the continent here. So, so there's a lot of local support for the non-European, non-Western teams at this tournament. Uh, That's created a very different vibe, a very different atmosphere. And I think uh, it has resulted in some of these, uh, what I, I suppose uh, can be looked at as upsets. Uh, like, I was, like I was mentioning, uh, Morocco, we've talked, of course, earlier about Saudi Arabia, about Japan beating Germany, uh, all these kind of results. So, so no, no one really taking anything for granted anymore as we enter the last stage of matches. And uh, I think coming up, one of the important 
another other sideline or sort of uh, conversation points that has emerged is the ongoing rivalry between Iran and the US. Uh, now, of course, there's a lot of political background to it, the economic sanctions and all of that, uh, which there are people who are much better placed and much better informed than me uh, to really talk about. But uh, from a football point of view, uh, Jürgen Klinsmann, uh, the former German striker, who was also the head coach of the United States men's football team for, I think, six years. Uh, he threw a bit of fat into the fire uh, yesterday, making some comments on the BBC where he's working as a, as a pundit. Uh, he's also part of FIFA's technical study group, uh, which is sort of the group of experts, which includes the likes of Arsene Wenger and several other uh, well-respected former players. Now, the technical study group is meant to look at the overall tournament from all perspectives, uh, competitiveness perspective and, and just overall organizational perspective from a technical footballing point of view. Uh, so, so he's doing two roles at this tournament and in, in this uh, conversation on the BBC, he accused or, or he, he, he talked of Iran's uh, culture. Uh, in, this is in the wake of their 2-0 win over Wales the other day in their second group stage match. Now, it was a highly physical game, a highly charged game. And uh, the accusation being made by this group of people was that uh, there was essentially unsportsmanlike behavior. And what Klinsman went on to say is that this is very much part of Iran's football culture and how they play the sport. But he didn't stop there. He went on, he was asked by one of his fellow commentators or pundits uh, whether if a European referee, the referee in charge of that game was uh, came from Guatemala, whether a European referee in that situation might have handled things differently and that might have led to a different kind of result. To which Klinsmann uh, went on to sort of dig the hole, uh, the racist hole that he had started digging uh, a little bit deeper by saying, yes, it would have been different because, you know, Iran have this culture and then the Guatemalans and the Hondurans, and he, he referred to his own experiences in the US and saying they kind of gang up and they uh, like talk it out and and nothing really happens. And so this kind of gamesmanship continues. Uh, the Iranian side responded uh, very quickly, saying, I don't, if, if you're a football fan or those of us, those, those of our audience who are, who are watching might remember, in 1982, there was a game that, that is now referred to as the disgrace of Gihon when the World Cup was being held in Spain. The game was between West Germany and Austria. Now, that group stage uh, was already, Algeria had played their game the previous day. And the result, the outcome was already known. So, Germany knew that or both teams, both Germany and Austria, West Germany at the time, uh, and Austria knew that if uh, the game ended in a 1-0 or a 2-1 win for West Germany, both West Germany and Austria would qualify for the next round at the expense of Algeria. So, they essentially didn't play that game. Germany scored an early goal. And after that, for the next 90 minutes, the game almost went to a standstill. So the Iranian side responded by saying, you know, we don't judge German footballing culture based on what you did then, which essentially is tantamount to fixing uh, and is definitely unsportsmanlike. Uh, so, so, so this uh, is adding uh, a sort of side narrative that builds up very nicely to that Iran-USA game, uh, which will have all of the kind of context and all of the storylines uh, that I suppose for neutral fans particularly make football uh, extremely interesting. And just lastly, if I have uh, another 30 seconds or so to conclude, we also have to remember that this thing about uh, this, this how the sporting culture of certain countries being, you know, a little more unsportsmanlike than others and how Europeans uphold some kind of sporting ideal or value. It's absolutely incorrect because how this is not a game uh, being played at this level. There are no hobbyists here. There are no amateurs here. Uh, there is so much uh, value and emphasis placed on winning that any team and every culture has its own terminology for this kind of uh, what we refer to as gamesmanship in English. Every culture and every culture has uh, sort of examples of this, like I was mentioning the, the 1982 game. So, uh, yes, sure, it is reflective maybe of uh, Iranian football culture and Guatemalan football culture, but it is equally reflective of Spanish football culture and English football culture and, and Europe in general. So, or Argentine football culture, for that matter. So, so, so to to you know, singular or to single out some of these countries as being particularly unsportsmanlike uh, is nothing other than uh, pure racism. 
and uh, we'll, we'll see how that conversation develops. But either way, I think it's going to be a really interesting game between Iran and the US. One of the highlights of the last round of matches for sure. Rightly said, Sudhan, there is not one football culture and not for uh, everybody, definitely. Thank you so much for joining us. Protests have erupted in the major cities across China against the zero COVID policy and associated measures. The protests began on Friday, November 25th in the Xinjiang region and have also been recorded in a number of other cities even as the number of cases have surged. Abdul from People's Dispatch joins us in studio with latest updates. Hello Abdul, welcome to the show. So, can you give us what's the latest information and what has led to the protests? Well, there are many uh, different versions uh, in, in media, particularly the Western media is mm. saying that the protests in China are primarily protests against the government, which is uh, not, which may not be the case. If you see the facts on the ground, the protests started in uh, 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 Xinjiang province, Urumqi, where uh, uh, 20 people, around 20 people died in a fire accident. There is a perception uh, that uh, the fire, uh, the, peop the death primarily was ca caused because of the uh, lockdown, a strict lockdown imposed by the, uh, uh, the provincial uh, administration there. Uh, uh, and that has basically created, uh, uh, added into the uh, prolonged anger which uh, a common Chinese is feeling because of the strict COVID uh, related uh, uh, policies adopted by the government, which is called the zero COVID policy. China has uh, adopted this policy given the fact that despite the, uh, the a substantial amount of time has uh, passed since the first infections were reported in 2019, uh, then uh, the uh, infection has acquired new uh, newer variants, uh, the virus has required newer variants, and uh, it is instead instead of kind of some kind of immunity emerging, it, uh, people are getting infected. Mm. And there is a high risk of uh, people dying uh, because of the COVID. So that is the logic behind which, in order to save the lives, Chinese government has adopted a zero COVID policy. But uh, as I said before, because of the uh, um, that strict lockdowns and because it has been a very long time now, uh, people are not happy with the uh, their continued forced uh, uh, kind of uh, isolation and uh, restrictions on their movements and so on and so forth. So that is the reason behind which uh, uh, behind the protests which are uh, uh, which are reported from different parts of China. Abdul, can you also explain to us what is this zero COVID policy? I mean, what has been the experience experience in China as compared to other countries also? Well, uh, the anger. As I said before, uh, uh, among the people is primarily because of the strictness of what we call the zero COVID policy. And China, Chinese uh, government has taken a very uh, strict position that the people uh, life, life of the people is more important than any other thing. And therefore, they have implemented uh, very strict measures wherever there is, uh, there is a number of cases rising to a particular level they impose uh, uh, lockdowns and they uh, basically uh, in some cities, in some provinces, there are also uh, uh, measures taken which basically leads to uh, 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 complete uh, shutting down of this uh, people uh, living in a particular reason. So uh, why they have taken that position? Uh, the reasons are very obvious. If you see, if you compare just for this month, uh, in the United States of America, there are already more than a million deaths because of the COVID. Uh, and the number of deaths in China is relatively very uh, low, given the difference in population and size mm. and so on and so forth. Uh, even in this month only, uh, uh, so far more than uh, 20,000 people have died uh, in, uh, in, sorry, in US uh, because of the COVID. In China, the total death is not more than some dozens. So that shows the difference. Uh, so zero COVID policy has though created economic uh, uh, problems, created uh, pe uh, freedom of movement problems, but it has also saved life of uh, uh, thousands of Chinese, particularly the people at vulnerable age group, uh, old people, uh, those who are not uh, healthy in, in a particular sense. So they have been able to, uh, China has been, has been able to save 
a number of lives which has not been the uh, case in uh, the countries which are cited as an example of uh, how covid uh, uh, basically restrictions have been lifted in different countries and china should also follow chinese uh, policy makers have reiterated that for them the life of people is more important than the uh, economic uh, 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 benefits which will come once you lift the uh, uh, zero covid policy mm. and so uh the the protests which are happening one should understand the anger coming from the prolonged uh, restrictions imposed on their movement but one should also understand it is quite uh, easy to understand that the, the logic behind strict covid policies so uh there is of course there uh, it seems there is a, a need to find out a kind of middle way in which uh, the people's movement of uh, freedom of movement is also preserved and the deaths are also avoided thank you abdul we'll get back to you for our next story november 29 marks the international day of solidarity with the palestinian people since the occupation began in 1948 the palestinians have witnessed an increasing number of civilian killings evictions and regular abuse of their human rights at the hands of israel the international community has inched closer and closer in its overt support to israel in the meanwhile abdul is back with us on this one So Abdul what does this day signify and can you also also explain what has been the role of the international community in this issue uh the day basically was uh, commemorated uh, in 1977 after decades of uh, the palestinian movement against the israeli occupation in un recognized that um, 29 november 29th the day is significant in the sense that this is the day on uh, on which in 1947 even adopted the uh, palestinian partition mm. resolution so that this keeping the um, keeping in mind the significant of the date and keeping in mind the uh, the prolonged palestinian uh, liberation movement uh, the un uh, co- uh, started uh, commemorating the day in 1977 um so the day basically signify signifies the uh, Uh, the world over uh, uh, solidarity mm. uh, with the palestinian people uh, the world's uh, pledge to uh, uh, protect the palestinians right to freedom uh, right to self determination and uh, to basically the right to fight against the israeli occupation that was uh, the logic with which this particular event uh, particular day was commemorated and from 1977 onwards uh, we have seen many ups and downs when it comes to the significance of this particular event uh, uh, in the early days uh, it means in 80s and uh, in early 90s there were uh, tremendous uh, uh, global uh, solidarity and uh, 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 pressure on the uh, uh, israel to kind of deal with its uh, kind of kind of deal with the palestinian issue with much more uh, sensitivity but for in last few uh, decades and particularly in the last few years there is there has been a gradual uh, decline between what the day signifies and what the actual uh, 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 realities are but abdul on that note there has been an evident gap between what <clears throat> the international community has promised and said in terms of the issue about palestine and what has been done so can you also explain a little bit about that of course uh, see in last particularly post 1990 uh, post the oslo uh, accord what we see in palestine is the world has uh, it seems that world has stopped caring about palestinians particularly the un though there are uh, institutional build ups there are a recognition of the palestinian mission in uh, uh, in un and there are uh, some kinds of funds also pouring in in some way or other it seems that that is the only thing un has uh, uh, reduced un's commitment or international communities commitments towards palestinians has reduced to uh, if you see uh, on the ground palestinians are facing oppression on their daily basis the number of settlements in the occupied palestinian territories have gone up uh, tremendously in last few years the number of killings of palestinians on the daily basis has increased this year itself according to the un is one of the deadliest years since 2005 in many ways uh, 
this uh, the number of displacement uh, of Palestinians from their villages, from their homes, from their uh, agricultural lands, uh, uprooting of their uh, whatever agricultural uh, facilities they had, the, the livelihood, uh, all those things are going on. And there are uh, increased assaults on uh, Palestinian uh, symbols, uh, for example, the attacks on Al-Aqsa, attacks on Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron and all. And so all those things are happening. Palestinian children, children are killed. Palestinians across the Green Line are uh, uh, facing some kind of ethnic and racial discrimination. There is a, a new government which is coming in Israel, which will, uh, which has, uh, which will have a minister which has openly uh, talked about uh, deporting Palestinians and so on and so forth. So what we have seen on the ground that there has been increased oppression by Israel in last 20 years at least, uh, but at the same time the international community has stopped, it seems, uh, taking any corrective measures, any pressure tactics, any uh, attempts to end the Israeli impunity. So all those things have, the, when it comes to actions, the actions have reduced drastically, but the rhetorical commitments like the commemoration of the day uh, of international solidarity is uh, still there. So uh, this gap between the action and the rhetoric is basic reason behind the prolonged suffering of the Palestinians on the ground. Thank you so much, Abdul. We'll keep talking about Palestine on the show with you. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories from around the world, check out our website www.peoplesdispatch.org and also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.